Welcome to the Independent Evaluation Unit's learning module on theories of change. Um, we're going to be talking about how to build good theories of change. It's a very short video. I'm Jo Puri and I head the Independent Evaluation Unit and I have with me my colleague. Hi, I'm Timothy Cha. Nice to meet you. Who's going to be co-presenting with me. Over to you, Tim. Great. Thank you so much, Jo. So let's dive into theories of change. You've probably seen a few models. Uh, many times they're visual diagrams. Um, they can focus on inputs, activities, outputs. Sometimes they're really complex with lots of pathways and arrows. Other times they can be pretty linear. Um, but yeah, this is just to illustrate that there are so many examples out there. And what we want to do today is provide some guidance um, on what a theory of change is. So what is it? It's, it tells a story of a program and its vision for change. A theory of change is a conceptual map of a program toward its goals. It articulates the program and its underlying assumptions, and it enables monitoring and evaluation. And you'll see that these are great tools for communicating your program to external stakeholders, um, and also within your own team, building consensus um, on what you're doing and what your goals are. And we want to highlight that, yes, it's a theory, and it's informed by evidence. So you should use evidence to inform your theory of change, and you should also update your theory of change according to new evidence and what you're finding on the ground. And so here's a quick comic to kind of illustrate this last point. Um, you'll see these two scientists have a really complex formula, and from their beginning to their, mid their end point, a miracle happens. And many times with our programs, we have our activities and our um, interventions, and then we have our goals. And if we're kind of not unpacking that what's happening in the middle and um, listing out those assumptions, then we're almost assuming that a miracle occurs. Uh, and so let's focus on the basics of a theory of change. So uh, perhaps you're familiar with the log frame, and perhaps there's even confusion about what a difference, the difference between log frames and theories of change are, uh, whereas log frames focus on problems, activities, outputs, outcomes, assumptions, um, in a very linear fashion, theory of change is quite different, and I'll let Joe uh, speak on that. Thank you. And so what we are talking about now is uh, the basics of a theory of change, and I want to familiarize you with a couple of terms that we're going to be using. Uh, the first is notes. So in a theory of change, you have what are called action points and or consequence points, and these are called notes, notes. Then we have arrows, arrows that go from one node to the next. And these capture the direction and the pathway from one node to the next. The third are assumptions, and this I know you're all very familiar with. These are conditions that must hold from one node to progress to the other node, um, as we would expect it. Right? And last but not least, at least we, are, we have what are called links. This is the hypothesized, testable relationship between two modes, uh, I beg your pardon, between two nodes that are informed by assumptions. And these are important because as we gather new evidence, these help to inform each one of these links. Okay, so here's an example of a link, basically that takes you from an action or a consequence to another action or a consequence which, like I said, are informed by assumptions, and the arrow in between refers to the pathway from one action or consequence to the other one. So I'm going to use the example of a very basic uh, program that we see in climate change. And what I'm going to present is very simple, but what we do want to let you know is that we understand that a lot of theories of change um, are, can become very complicated and uh, can include in them very complex relationships as well. But it's a really good idea to start off with what we know as basics, and we're also encouraging you to use some of the resources that we are presenting along with this video on our webpage. So many climate change programs are, um, can be illustrated through the theory of change that we're going to show now. These include renewable energy programs, adaptation programs, large-scale transportation programs, uh, recycling programs, livelihoods, etc. And they basically run like this. There is a program, and in this case, uh, we're using the example of an efficient cookstove program, 
where a scheme or a program is established. People use these efficient cookstoves. This leads to a reduction in indoor air pollution, uh, which in turn means uh, lesser greenhouse gas emissions and hopefully leads to better life in the environment, income, etc. Now, like I said, of course, this is very simple. And we can uh, definitely already imagine various other relationships that could be forged between each one of these between each one of these nodes that could help to inform the uh, links. But what I want to really focus on is the importance of looking at how we build assumptions and what we think are important for program people and implementation teams to recognize. So here's one link that we are using it as an example. This link basically takes you from establishing the program, in this case the efficient cookstove program, to people using these efficient cookstoves. It might seem like a very simple link, but implicit in this are very, very strong assumptions that are being made. And let me illustrate that. So the first assumption, of course, is that there is an effective targeting mechanism that enables program implementers and planners to go from just establishing the scheme to people actually using it. That is, you are able to, uh, within the program, target the people that are using traditional cookstoves and, will, um, and are much more likely to replace these with the more efficient cookstoves than not. So you're hopefully not targeting or getting to people um, that are using, for example, LPG or are using um, um, electric stoves, for example, right? So you are targeting, you're able to target and identify the people that are currently using traditional cook stoves. Within that, then, are further assumptions. The first one is that, yes, once you've identified your target group and you, you know where they're located and how to get to them, uh, the, the folks that are targeted know about the program, right? Um, that the efficient cook stoves are actually being distributed by the program. And that's important because it also speaks to the implementation of the program as well as the implementation fidelity of the program. That is, we are able to gauge through our monitoring as to how well the program is being implemented on the ground. The other assumption also is that households actually like the new cook stoves, which is one of the preconditions for them actually switching to efficient cook stoves. Um, and that they don't phase out of the program. That is, this change is, isn't transient. And that people are uh, continue to use these efficient cook stoves over a um, significant period of time. Um, it also assumes that the households that are being targeted um, know how to use these efficient cook stoves. And last but not least, um, the improved e efficiency of these cook stoves is sufficient incentive for use. Now, there is also another assumption, of course, that the efficient cook stoves are actually efficient. And that speaks to the efficacy of the program itself. And that's really important to establish. So I just quickly want to point out that there are important assumptions that we are making for every link. Within them, the effectiveness, the implementation fidelity, and the efficacy of the program should constantly be judged. And this speaks to the critical bottleneck question. What we're encouraging you to do is also th to think about not just about every assumption that is clearly required for each one of these programs to run, but also to be open and clear about what are possibly critical bottlenecks. Because these critical not bottlenecks are the ones that will require far greater scrutiny, far greater attention through the monitoring program that the, uh, that the planners have set up. So I'm going to take this over back to Tim again now. Thanks, Joe. Um, so now you have the basics of the theory of change, and we're leaving you with a quick checklist to provide some guidance as you go about. Um, so nodes, again, they capture actions and or consequences, and since they don't capture change, you have your arrows to do that. Arrows point for each node. For each node, they point to um, another node. And um, each arrow only captures one uh, one hypothesized and testable relationship. Of course, you can have many arrows. Um, 
And uh, remember that errors could also graphically represent, you can change it graphically to represent the time that you expect um, for your change to happen or um, the size of how, uh, of that change. Um, and remember to articulate your assumptions, um, which have to be included in all the linked pathways. And uh, make sure that your results are measurable and observable. And of course, that evidence is used to inform every link. And again, theories of change are theory, making theories of change. Um, it's a it's an iterative process, and it's a living document. You should revisit it with evidence as it comes, um, and engage your stakeholders, engage your team as you build it. And so, thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions at all, or if you're interested in engaging with the IEU, please feel free to reach out to us on our website or at the email listed there. Thank you again. Thank you.